Hey everybody, it's Nurse Eunice with Florida Training Academy, and this evening we're going to review an additional 25 practice nurse aid exam questions with answers. And let us begin. Number 26, the client asked the nursing assistant to assist her to cut her toenails. The nursing assistant knows this client has type 2 diabetes. Which of the following actions is best? A, retrieve a safety clipper and hand it to the client. B, report to the nurse that the client needs her toenails trimmed. C, check the client's blood glucose before cutting her toenails. Or D, check the chart for physician orders regarding toenail trimming. All right, and what do you think is the safest for the patient um, in your care if you are a CNA and this patient has type 2 diabetes? If you said D, Check the chart for the physician's order regarding nail trimming. You're correct. Um, you're not supposed to be, um, in most instances, clipping a patient's toenails, especially if they're a diabetic, because we don't want to nick their skin. Um, those with uncontrolled diabetes or chronic diabetes sometimes have issues with healing. And if you nick their skin, they can become infected. So usually a podiatrist is the one who does the toenail clippings, not the CNAs and not the nursing. But here's the explanation. Diabetic clients often have special instructions regarding nail trimming. Check the chart for specific orders. And of course, if you don't see it in the chart, go and ask the nurse. Number 27, which of the five options is the best method to prevent insomnia or um, an, an in inability to sleep? So A, ensure the client eats one apple per day. B, encourage the client to take several naps daily. C, encourage the client to take several walks around a facility daily. Or D, encourage the client to remain in bed throughout the day. All right, so if you're trying to prevent insomnia, the correct answer is C, we're going to get this person to exercise. So we're going to encourage the client to take several walks around the facility daily. So walking and physical activity during the day promotes rest and well-being at night. So if you have a patient who has insomnia, get them out the bed because the longer they're in the bed, the more likely they are just to keep sleeping during the day and then they'll be awake at night. Number 28. The nursing assistant takes the temperature of an elderly client and finds it to be 100.6 degrees Fahrenheit. The client reports having just taken a sip of hot tea. Which of the following actions is appropriate? A, the nursing assistant waits at least 15 minutes before retaking the temperature. B, the nursing assistant records the temperature in the chart. C, the nursing assistant scolds the client for not letting her know beforehand. Or D, the nursing assistant takes an axillary temperature instead. And the axillary temperatures are the ones that's done in the armpit. The correct answer is A. A nursing assistant should be waiting 15 minutes before retaking the temperature if a person has eaten, drank, or smoked. And here's our explanation. Waiting 15 minutes ensures the temperature of the mouth will be more accurate. Axillary temperatures in the elderly are often not the best um, route for measurement. Number 29. A client under the nursing assistant's care suffers from chronic foot drop. So the foot goes down as if they're pressing on a gas pedal. It's going to make it difficult for them to ambulate. The nursing assistant can expect to find which of the following devices in the client's room. A, a wedge. B, a mechanical lift. C, positioning boots. Or D, two extra pillows. And if you said C, positioning boots, you're correct. The explanation, the boots will ensure that the feet are dorsiflexed to prevent contractures and discomforts. We want to make sure those feet remain in the proper position and not leaning forward. Number 30, a nursing assistant takes the blood pressure of a client and finds it to be 82 over 43. The client reports feeling dizzy. The nursing assistant should A, take the client's pulse next, B, report the finding to the nurse, C, record the vital sign in the chart, D, instruct the client to drink more fluids. Again, thinking of patient safety, what's going to be the safest for your patient if their blood pressure is 82 over 43? 
And if you said B, report the finding to the nurse, you're absolutely correct. It's very important to report a symptomatic low blood pressure to the nurse for further investigation. Symptomatic because the patient was dizzy. And so once you notify the nurse, that's when you can get those other vital signs. And if the nurse needs you to go out and get any supplies, um, she'll have you do so. Number 31, the range of motion term abduction means A, moving the extremity away from the body. B, moving the extremity toward the body. C, moving the extremity above the body. Or D, moving the extremity below the body. Whenever someone abducts a person, you know, unfortunately, whenever a child is abducted, abducted, excuse me, that child is taken away. So that's how I remember abduction. And so the answer is A, moving the extremity away from the body um, is what it means to abduct. To bring the body part back towards the body is to adduct. That's when you move it closer. So abduct is away, adduct is back towards. Number 32, which of the five most addresses a client's needs in regards to spirituality? A, ask the client why he or she is of a particular faith. B, provide the client with a warm, with warm water, soap, and towels every morning. C, assist the client to the facility's chapel every Sunday. D, treat any religious objects in the client's room as if they were any other. So let me repeat number D, or excuse me, letter D. <laughs> treat any religious objects in the client's rooms as if they were any other. So in other words, you're not really caring about those religious objects. And the correct answer is C. You're going to assist the client to the facility's chapel every Sunday. Explanation, support the client in their own religious beliefs or religious needs. Um, treat any religious objects in the room with respect. And we knew that. 33, proper body mechanics when lifting clients involve which of the following? A, keep the spine curved. B, bending at the waist. C, bending at the knees. D, avoid seeking assistance. So good body mechanics are utilized so that you as the caregiver, you don't hurt yourself. And so if you keep your spine curved, well, we know that's not going to be good. So let's see which is the best response. Yes. Yeah, so whenever you um, bend, you want to use those large leg muscles. You don't want to bend with, at your waist or at your back. And here's the explanation. Bending at the knees is the only proper body mechanic listed. Avoid doing all the others. And the others were bending at the waist um, and avoid seeking assistance. And of course, we're not going to keep our spine curved. That wouldn't be healthy. We probably have back pain. 34, which of the following would be a primary indication of hepatitis? So that would be a disease of the liver. A, hypertension, B, hyperglycemia, C, jaundice, or D, hypotension. So whenever a person has hepatitis, um, sometimes they will appear jaundiced. So the answer is going to be C. And jaundice is also known as the yellowing of the skin, and it occurs frequently in patients with hepatitis. 35, which of the following aspects of care is important for a confused client? A, checking the client's blood sugar every hour. B, asking the client their name. C, keeping the client contained in their room. Or D, reorienting the client frequently with clocks, calendars, and family mementos. Ah, that was an easy one. Yes, it's D. And here's the explanation. Reorienting the patient frequently is the most important aspect of care. You're caring for someone who's confused. Keeping the client locked in their room could agitate them, as could asking them their name, which they might not remember. And so usually you ask them their name, you know, maybe upon the first part of your shift or if you're providing any care and um, hopefully they can provide you with their name. And if not, some facilities will have um, armbands. Others may have photos. When in doubt, contact the nurse if you need to know the name of a patient who is confused so that we know that we're providing the proper care on the proper person. 36. What type of client may opt to receive hospice care? 
A, a client with kidney disease, B, a client with cancer, C, a terminally ill client, or D, a client with diabetes. So hospice is palliative care, comfort care. Which of the following clients would need hospice care? And if you chose C, you're absolutely correct. So a terminally ill client may receive hospice care, which is designed to relieve pain rather than to cure disease. And so if you are questioning some of those other options, just because someone has kidney disease or, or has cancer or diabetes, that doesn't mean it is terminal. Some cancers, diabetes, and also kidney disease, it can be treatable. Okay, so um, a terminal illness, maybe like stage four cancer, um, is something that would be a terminal condition for a patient. 37, chain stokes resp respirations occur in a client who A, has a history of chronic pulmonary, excuse me, chronic respiratory issues, B, is unconscious, C, is recovering from an asthma attack, or is D, close to death. All right, and so that's like a precursor to death. So the answer is D. And so your, your chain stokes respirations are a breathing pattern marked by increased respirations, labored breathings, <laughs> periods of, ap of apnea or no breathing. It is important to report these signs if discovered in a resident who is not expected to show them. For example, since we were just talking about a patient who's um, maybe is, um, assigned to hospice care, um, we know that as they're approaching death, this would be a, you know, a breathing pattern that we'd expect. But if this is not somebody who is on hospice care, somebody who's a full code, and you see these abnormal gasps, um, that is a medical emergency. Make sure you alert your nurse right away. 38. A client in the day room is having a panic attack. The nursing assistant should tell the client to breathe as slowly and deeply as possible. B, have the client talk about the panic attack. C, encourage the client to verbalize their feelings. Or D, ask the client about the cause of the panic attack. All right, and so someone is actively having a panic attack. What do you want to do? Yes, you want them to control their breathing. So you're going to do A, tell the client to breathe as slowly and as deeply as possible. And here's the explanation. During a panic attack, the nursing assistant should make the client comfortable and encourage them to breathe slowly and deeply. Asking them to count backwards slowly from 100 can also be helpful. During an attack, the client is unable to talk about anxious situations and isn't able to address uncomfortable feelings and frustrations. While having a panic attack, the client is also unable to focus on anything other than the symptoms. So the client won't be able to discuss the cause of the attack. So let's get our patients breathing normalized first, and then we can you know, talk about what may have caused them to be you know, in a panic state afterwards. 39, which of the following residents is demonstrating orthopnic position? A, a resident sits in a chair with their back straight. A resident sits on the side of the bed and leans forward over a bedside table. A resident walks using a cane. A resident lays on their stomach with their face to the side. And it's going to be B as in boy. A resident sits on the side of the bed and leans forward over the bedside table. Explanation, the orthopnic position is meant to assist in breathing and leaning forward makes it easier to get the air into the lungs. 40, a resident is choosing items for breakfast. Which of the following items contains the most potassium? A, eggs, B, cantaloupe, C, toast, or D, strawberries? And this one's a hard one for me. Um, I know it's not A or C, so I'm torn between B and D. But which one has the most potassium? I'll give you a few seconds to look that up. And there's your answer. The answer is B, cantaloupe, which I probably would not have chosen. <laughs> cantaloupe is a melon that contains massive amounts of potassium. Other foods that contain high potassium include bananas and dark leafy greens.
Question number 41, when helping a client with left-sided weakness due to a CVA, which is a cerebrovascular accident or a stroke, the nursing assistant should position the client's cane um, in front of the client, which is A, B, on the left side of the client, C, on the right side of the client, or D, away from the client. And so if this person has left-sided weakness, where do you think the cane should be? And if you said C on the right side, you're correct. And here's the explanation. The nursing assistant should place the cane on the side that's the strongest. And so I want you to think about it. If the person has left-sided weakness and you have them use the cane on the left side, that's the weak side. So, you know, the person could still fall or they may be able, unable to even hold on to the cane. So it's usually best to have them use the cane on their strong side. 42, CPR. Cardiopulmonary resuscitation should be performed when A, a client is unconscious, B, a client is choking, C, a client has no pulse and is not breathing, or D, a client has a pulse but is not breathing. So when do we perform CPR, which consists of chest compressions and rescue reps? Yep, you knew it, is C, a client who has no pulse and is not breathing. So CPR is performed on a client who is pulseless and apneic. And so that's when you do your 10 second BLS assessment where you're feeling for the carotid pulse and you're checking for breathing simultaneously for no more than six seconds, because for no more than 10 seconds, if the person doesn't have any signs of life, of course, you're gonna start CPR. If you haven't already called for the team, please do so, um, notify your nurse and press that code button. 43, a nursing assistant enters a client's room and finds a fire burning in a trash can. The nursing assistant's first action is to A, call the nurse for help, B, remove the patient, C, try to put the fire, try to put out the fire, or D, pull the fire alarm. So there is a client in the room with a fire. Your best response would be to B, remove the patient. And you always want to think of the acronym RACE, um, which is used for fire situations. And RACE stands for rescue, which means to remove the patients who are in danger. Then you can press the alarm. Um, that could be you, you know, calling the nurse or pulling a fire extinguisher or calling the um, fire department, excuse me. C, you're going to contain the fire. Most of your facilities have fire graded doors. So containing a fire could be closing the doors to all the residents or patients' rooms and also closing the door in the hallway. And then the E actually has two meanings. E could stand for extinguish. And whenever you're using a fire extinguisher, the term or the acronym we use is PASS. And PASS stands for, um, of course, we're going to pull the pin. We're going to aim towards the base of the fire. We're going to squeeze the nozzle and we're going to sweep at the base of the fire. So we're going back and forth. Um, so anyway, the acronym RACE is used for fire situations. And um, you always want to rescue the person first. And that way we don't have any harm caused to the patient. 44, log rolling is a technique best used for which of the following patient diagnoses? A, a left tibial fracture. B, spinal cord injury. C, cellulitis of the right arm, or D, psychosis. And I'm going to go back through those. Log rolling. Would you log roll somebody who had a broken leg? Would you log roll somebody who had a broken back? Would you log roll somebody who had a skin infection on their right arm? Or would you log roll someone who's having a mental breakdown? You got it. Yes. The answer is B, spinal cord injury. The explanation, an SCI patient is prone to further damage and injury um, in order to prevent spinal cord let me rephrase that. A SCI patient is prone to further damage and injury to the spinal cord if the legs cross over the midline in a twisting motion. Um, this can be avoided with proper log rolling techniques. 45, when a client consistently ignores the urge to void, the client is putting themselves in danger of what complication? So what does it mean to void? A, constipation, B, incontinence, C, insomnia, or D, poor appetite. So I want you to think about that nursing bladder. 
Those nurses are always so busy. They rarely go to the bathroom. And because they are not voiding or emptying their bladder, what ends up happening is they may become incontinent over time. And incontinence is um, pretty much when they are wet in themselves. So incontinence can occur if the bladder becomes too full or is unrelieved. 46, which of the following types of grief is considered a normal and healthy part of grieving? A, anticipatory, B, complicated, C, unresolved, or D, inhibited? All right, so which of the thoughts consider a normie, normal and healthy part of grieving? A, anticipatory. So anticipatory grief occurs before the loss actually happens and is a normal part of grieving. Complicated, unresolved, and inhibited in inhibited grieving indicates that there is a problem with recovering from the loss. And so anticipatory grief, I want you to think about maybe someone whose uh, mother has been in chronic pain due to cancer. And um, you're, you know that the mom has signed up for hospice. You're there and you're supporting the mom. So you're kind of anticipating this loss and you may be having grief, you know, beforehand. Um, you know, just thinking about what's going to happen to your mom and how your family's going to be impacted. And so, but that would be normal grieving. 47, a patient is on a clear liquid diet. Which of the fawn is not allowed on this diet? A, water. B, tea. C, coffee. D, orange juice with pulp. That was an easy one. Yep, D, orange juice with pulp. If it's clear liquid, we need to be able to see through it. The fact that it has pulp, number one, tells you that it's not clear, and you usually can't see through orange juice. It's acidic. Um, so here's the explanation. Orange juice with pulp is not allowed. The pulp is considered part of a, the pulp is not considered part of a clear liquid diet. Tea, coffee, and water are all allowed on the clear liquid diet. 48. A client with a Foley catheter is ordered to ambulate twice daily. Before ambulating a client, the nursing assistant should A, keep the bag below the bladder level, C, raise the bag above the level, the bladder level, or C, have the patient cover the bag with a pillowcase, and finally D, ask the nurse to confirm this order. You can walk a patient who has a Foley catheter or an indwelling urinary catheter. You can walk them, but to walk them safely, you have to do A, you have to keep the urine bag below the level of the bladder. And here's the explanation. Keeping the bag below the level of the cavity ensures that bacteria cannot migrate up from the bag and up into the bladder due to gravity. So in other words, again, if they're walking with the bag or you're holding a bag, you make sure you keep that bag below the waist level because as soon as you hold the bag up, the old urine backflows, and it can cause your patient to have bacteria enter their urinary tract. 49, which of the following items is necessary in order to place a patient in restraints? A, the hospital administrator's approval. B, the charge nurse's approval. C, physical restraints. Or D, a physician's order. Yes, we have to have an order to restrain people so that nurse has to notify the doctor. So the physician needs to order restraints before they can be legally applied. No one else can ask for restraints for a patient or it is considered battery. So the physician actually writes the order, which usually expires every 24 hours, and then the nurse will enforce it. And of course, the CNA will help to apply the restraints. And we're on our last question, number 50. A client eats a bagel and one large glass of orange juice. What is the correct way to record the amount of juice? Did the patient receive 480 cc's, which is A, or B, 120 cc? Did they receive C, 1 ml, or D, 360 ml? It's kind of tricky. <laughs> Let's look at the explanation. The answer is D, 360 mLs. All right, and so the abbreviation of CC, according to this exam, don't shoot the messenger, is no longer appropriate in the medical field. 
Okay. And usually we can use CCs and MLs interchangeably, but with time, things change. And so only ML should be used. And this one says a large glass is 480 mLs, but the correct response was 360 um, mLs. So if you think about a 12 ounce glass of juice, I consider that large. Um, whenever we're trying to go from um, ounces to mLs, we have 12 ounces. We were multiplied 12 by 30. So one ounce equals 30 mLs. And if we have a 12 ounce glass of juice, 360, um, that would be the correct answer. This is a typo. So that should say 360 also. And guess what, everybody? We have completed our 25 question review for tonight. It's Wednesday, November the 1st. So I thank you for spending time with Nurse Eunice. Um, I do apologize if I made a couple of mistakes in this video. It's a little late here, but I want to go ahead and put this video out. Um, and I'll try to come up with another um, set of questions to review on next Wednesday. So don't forget to like the video, subscribe to our channel, and I'll see you in a few months.